Good morning. I welcome all of you this morning on this lovely 4th of July day. As you may note, there are many activities that are coming up in the coming weeks. I would like to draw your attention to next Sunday in particular. We will have a special congregational meeting following worship where we will ratify the budget that was voted in during our suspension by the church council. We will also ratify our um, nominations of the people that have begun serving in those positions in January. We will also be voting on the possible sale of a portion of the church land toward the parking lot area. That will happen immediately following worship and it hopefully should not take too long. And then on July 18th, we will have an all church uh, cookout immediately following worship down at the CE building. We are asking that if you are planning to attend that you please sign up so that we are aware of how much supplies to purchase for that barbecue. And then on July 24th, we once again will be participating in the Gay Pride Parade and Festival. If you are interested in walking, there is a place to sign up as well in the Narthex and also to staff our booth, which will be from 11 until 5 on the 24th of July. I believe that's it for our announcements. Please take a few moments to greet one another. I just want to say that it's really awesome to be back in the Lord's house again together. Please join me in the call to worship. God is with us wherever we go. Let us together recognize God's presence here. God is the creator of our lives and does not abandon us on life's pilgrimage. God relates to us as a parent, loving and nurturing. We have known the steadfast love of God when we are faithful and when we stray. We hear God calling us to covenant renewal, offering us strength to overcome all our weaknesses. Let us worship together.
Please join me in the prayer of invocation found in your bulletin. Draw us near to you that we may recognize your all-sustaining love and power, O oh God. Come to us in our weakness and vulnerability, that we may face with new confidence the hardships and calamities of life. Help us to hear the wisdom resident among us as we listen to one another. May each of us be channels of your revelation and willing knowledge, acknowledge your presence and guidance as it comes in unexpected times, places, and people. Amen. This morning's first reading is from 2 Samuel. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led us out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, It is you who shall be shepherd of my people, Israel. You who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the kingdom of Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over is all Israel and Judah 33 years. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from the Milo inward, and David became greater and greater for the Lord. The God of hosts was with him. Our second reading this morning is from Mark. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph, and Judah and Simon, and not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not with honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could not do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. 
they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. May the Lord add his blessings to our hearing of today's word. Amen. What grace is mine that he who dwells in endless light called through the night to find my distant soul and from his scars poured mercy that would plead for me that I might live and in his name be known. So I will go wherever he is calling me. I lose my life to find my life in him. I give my all to gain the hope that never dies. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and follow him. What grace is mine to know his breath alive in me. Beneath his wings my wakened soul may soar. All fear can flee, for death's dark night is overcome. My Savior lives and reigns forevermore. So I will go wherever he is calling me. I lose my life to find my life in him. I give my all to gain the hope that never dies. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and follow him. Thank you, Paul. That was a beautiful rendition of Danny Boy with appropriate lyrics. Beautiful. <laughs> Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day. Amen. Have you ever noticed that a lot of our conversations around hospitality are rather one-sided. That is, we tend to talk about our hospitable nature, our hospitality as a spiritual gift, our willingness to extend hospitality, all the while painting ourselves as being something special and patting ourselves on the back. But when was the last time that you accepted hospitality? When was the last time that you relied on hospitality? Because it's one thing to be invited to dinner. It's quite another thing to wonder where dinner will come from if you're not. According to Jesus, discipleship demands dependence on hospitality. And this dependence is not just doing it, but also receiving it and needing it. Well, that's a whole different story, a story witnessed as we see news footage of our southern border, regardless of your opinion on immigration, illegal or legal, the reality of border issues has major implications for how our imagination works when it comes to hospitality. As we celebrate July 4th, we can't help but recall the inscription on the Statue of Liberty, give me 
you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Needing hospitality is a story that requires vulnerability and letting go. A story that gives up control and eases in to risk. A story that anticipates rejection at every turn and yet gives witness to God's love regardless of that possible rejection. Of course, hospitality was indispensable in the ancient world. There are and were few restaurants or hotels along one's journeys on the dusty roads of Palestine. Little travel was possible without the assumption and the expectation of hospitality. In fact, there would hardly be a mission to the Gentiles without counting on the hospitality of the absolute other. But we should not let 2,000 years and our taming of the gospel justify the claim that hospitality is any less essential today. Hospitality is not just having someone over for a nice meal. Hospitality is not just letting someone in for a spell. And really there's no such thing as radical hospitality or genuine hospitality. We like to add all kinds of adjectives to our hospitality practices as if to suggest that ours is better than others. But at its heart, hospitality is by definition radical. There is no other kind of has hospitality. You either are or you aren't. If you welcome some and exclude others, don't pretend that you are hospitable. When Mother Emanuel AME Church flung open its doors in radical welcome, the Sunday after the shooting that happened six years ago, killing nine African Americans while at a Bible study, did we, could we, even imagine what it would be like to walk through those doors that Sunday. Are we ready for that kind of hospitality? Are we prepared for that kind of showing mercy? Are we willing to be received with that kind of welcome? If we are not, then perhaps discipleship. At least Jesus' version of it in the Gospel of Mark is not for us. And as many Christians claim that hospitality is necessary, important, that it is a touchstone of the church, many still seem hell-bent on doing the best that they can to communicate an inhospitable nature with extended and belabored conversations about who is welcome at the Lord's table with welcome coordinators and name tag stations and visitor cards in the pews to suffice as genuine reception to another and biblical interpretations that result in hate and not love. Many persist in supporting systems and rules that secure institutional and denominational futures that come from a place of entrenchment and fear rather than openness and hope. True hospitality is too vulnerable for most of us. This is the real rub of the story of the Good Samaritan. Does the guy in the ditch really want help from the Samaritan, or would he rather die? The latter is the point. Would we rather die than accept assistance from those people? I had a member 
at a previous church who would meet someone down on their luck, homeless, unemployed, hungry, and in need of genuine hospitality, and she freely and generously gave it, welcoming strangers into her home, providing them with food and a place to hang their hats until they were back on their feet. She didn't require a background check or even a valid ID. She just gave of herself and her resources freely. She knew what hospitality, true hospitality, the kind that Jesus speaks of, was all about. Now maybe this is the week to take stock of the hospitality practiced by us. Do we practice hospitality? When was the last time that we addressed seriously our vocabulary, our theology, our stories on the basis of or through the lens of hospitality as a theological category? In most of our words, get only nods of acceptance and uh, acquiescence, we may not really be practicing the kind of hospitality that Jesus lived and on which he insisted from his disciples. If most of what we say is palatable to others, we may not be practicing hospitality at all but merely a watered-down version of welcoming the stranger. Hospitality is bold, reckless, risky, and often not the kind of welcome good folk do on a regular basis. Or maybe we need to admit our own need for hospitality. Maybe this is the week that we walk through the doors open to us and let go of our excuses about discomfort and time and worthiness, maybe this week we truly give up control and give in to what others want to do for us. Back to my previous church member. When she became ill, gravely so, and her current homeless no longer homeless house guest reached out to care for her during her recuperation, she flat out refused. She could not accept the hospitality from another that she was noted for extending to others. She had many excuses to not let go of that control. Accepting hospitality isn't easy, nor is offering true hospitality to another. And it will probably be uncomfortable and more than a little messy. A theology of hospitality requires a reassessment of everything. Practices, language, symbols, rituals, sacraments, decisions, and where we falsely assume power is located, but it's worth it. Because to experience the kind of hospitality that Jesus has in mind is to experience the love of God so deep, so wide, so huge. The love of our God that shows mercy no matter what. The love of our God which becomes flesh so that the doors of our hearts might be flung open to all to give and receive true hospitality. Amen.
Let us come before God in an attitude of prayer. And as we do, we lift up those from our congregation who are in need of our prayers. And so we lift up Linda. Her best friend, Joyce, passed away on July 1st. She would also like prayers lifted for Joyce's mother, Karen, and for her, her husband, John. Let us also continue to surround Carol and my mom, Jan, with our prayers for healing power as they continue their recuperation toward wholeness. And let us also surround the family and friends of those who lost loved ones in Florida with the building collapse and to those families who are still seeking for their loved ones. Let us pray. Oh God, of extravagant welcome and love, your holy scripture teach us how to be hospitable and open to all, but also how to receive that same hospitality back when we too are in need. Give us, O oh God, the courage to offer that type of hospitality to others. And give us the humility, O oh God, to be able to accept it when offered to us. Today, O oh God, we ask for your blessing on our country as we celebrate another Independence Day. Remind us once again what this country was founded on, on hospitality and on freedom for all. Be with those who lead our country. Guide them with your wisdom and empower them with your spirit to do righteousness and justice in your eyes. Hear now, O oh God, our silent prayers, prayers lifted to you for ourselves and for others. We lift these prayers to you in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now I invite you to partake in the sacred meal where we remember the life and death of Jesus Christ. Please know that we set an open table. You need not be a member of this church or any church to partake in this meal. All we ask is that you profess a faith in God. If you did not pick up a communion element as you were entering, just raise your hand and our usher will come and bring it to you. Let us join now in our prayer of consecration. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the mighty sweep of your love, embracing all people and all nations. We thank you that you have sent Jesus to us to break down the walls of hostility which divide the earth's people and to reveal your all-encompassing love, making us all one. Through the power of your spirit, may this unity become reality. Now by your presence, make sacred this feast in memory of Jesus, your servant, and in whose name we pray. Amen. We remember how Jesus took the bread during that last meal that he shared with his beloved disciples and friends. And how he took it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And in the same way, after supper and after giving thanks to God, Jesus took the cup and pouring it, he gave it to his beloved disciples and friends, saying, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the forgiveness of all sins. Do this as often as you eat and drink in remembrance of me. Let us join together in the prayer of thanksgiving. God of new life, with joy we have received this sacrament of the bread of life and the cup of blessing, giving you thanks for Jesus, our peace and our hope. Unite your church in continuing Christ's ministry of love and servanthood that your name may be praised in all the earth. Amen.
And now may the peace of Christ, the love of God, and the courage of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.